Hey, welcome to another episode of Health, Wellness, and Nutrition with Dr. Dan Remley. Dr. Dan Remley is an associate professor and a uh, field specialist with the Food, Nutrition, and Wellness uh, at the College of Food, Agriculture, and Environmental Sciences at the Ohio State University. Uh, today, he's going to be talking about biotechnology and some of the different ways in which we process food. So stay tuned. Dan, it's always a pleasure talking with you. You have a really good topic today. Yeah, I'm going to talk about um, food biotechnology and um, some of the new ways that um, we manipulate um, crops using um, genetically modified um, organisms and, and um, talk about how that has helped us and has helped our um, agricultural system and our food system and some of the concerns uh, related to um, genetically modified foods. So it seems that there's a lot of people that are either for or against. Uh, there's not a lot of uh, in between, it seems. Yeah, I think you're right. I, I think, uh, and that's, that's uh, the, like a lot of things. I think people have their opinions and, uh, uh, some people have informed opinions and some people um, maybe they're scared or they've heard something. Um, they they may have read some, some, um, some things on the internet that, uh, that are, uh, that have some questionable, they use some questionable sources and that type of thing. So, you know, it's like what we always do in extension. We try to uh, provide uh, research based information and, and have um, and people can make up their own minds about things. So, so we have an abundant food supply today in America and around the world. And um, that's partially because we've been able to advance the way that we, <clears throat> our, our science has um, improved that we, <clears throat> the way in which we can grow things. <clears throat> so we're, we're growing food on <clears throat> land that, um, Previously was not cultivated. We're uh, more efficient with our agriculture now. I mean, you can go to um, the desert and see that they're they're growing all kinds of things even in the desert. And, uh, and and we can thank biotechnology for these advances. And so, so Dan, what what do you mean by biotechnology? Manipulating the um, the genetic makeup of plants and animals to uh, produce. Uh, traits that are that are desirable for us so it could be um, manipulating the, uh, the genetic code for a plant that so that it has more nutrition or it tastes better for example and you know we might do the same with animals or they we might um, manipulate their genetic uh, material so that the plants or animals are resistant to disease pests that type of thing and so it's, it's really helped us. It's really helped us become more efficient with our agriculture. Now, we've, we've been um, crossbreeding plants and animals for years to, um, to get a more desirable um, you know, plants and animals. Uh, but we, we have, uh, <clears throat> we've advanced to the point where we actually can, uh, rather than crossbreeding, we can actually go in and manipulate the genetic material which is, um, it's, it's really very, very different from what we've, uh, we've traditionally done in the past with agriculture. Genetically modifying plants and animals, it uh, often happens in the laboratory, but the end result, as I said earlier, can be plants and animals that are more desirable for consumers. Um, we see a lot of genetically um, modified uh, products today, and so that's, that's a benefit of, um, of our, our food biotechnology. We crossbreed. Let, let's take dogs for an example. Uh, originally, a dog came from a wolf. And through crossbreeding, we were able to raise a variety of different species. Mm -hmm. and I think the, the same can be said about food. Uh, right. if you want uh, plumper corn 
or we want uh, bigger strawberries or things of that nature. Yes. We crossbreed them with other items that, uh, you know, ba basically allow those plants to grow. Now, the genetics, in taking those genetics, we're really just skipping uh, the crossbreeding. Wouldn't you say, you know, we're, we're cutting down the number of cycles, you know, to crossbreed? Yeah, so we, you're right. We do, we do crossbreed a lot of um, – most of our agricultural products we see in the store are, result, are the result of crossbreeding different varieties. And so <clears throat> we'll crossbreed different apple varieties to get uh, new varieties of apples that are, in, in my opinion, taste better. They're are crispier or sweeter than, you know, than maybe our ancestors um, had when they went to the grocery store. <laughs> you know, maybe my grandparents went to the grocery store. They might have had two or three varieties of apples to choose from, and now we've got maybe 20. <laughs> and that's the result of, you know, crossbreeding the, the apple varieties to get varieties that are more desirable for consumers. So it does take generations, and we've gotten better at crossbreeding you know, most of our um, fruits and vegetables and that type of thing. So most of the most of the um, most of the fruits and vegetables and produce and even uh, are the result of of crossbreeding techniques in the grocery store, because in essence, when we crossbreed something, we are getting rid of undesirable genes, are we not? Right, right. So when you say undesirable, it's undesirable for us as consumers, and so. Um, we, we get um, products such as apples that taste better, <laughs> have better texture, you know, those, those types of things that consumers desire in food. Now, uh, sometimes also we use uh, genetic technology to, uh, to produce plants that could be resistant to um, herbicides, and we'll talk more about that, or um, certain pests. An example might be um, corn varieties that... Um, are genetically modified so that they're resistant to the corn borer, which, which can be devastating to corn crops. Really, in the U.S., more than 70% of our soybeans and about 30% of corn crop are genetically engineered. And so genetic engineering, genetically modified, is a little bit different than crossbreeding because what we do is we go into the DNA and we change the DNA to get those more desirable um, traits in our in our plants and animals. So in the case of uh, soybeans, um, there are Roundup Ready beans, for example, that um, are sold to farmers. And farmers can spray herbicide and it won't kill the beans, but it kills the weeds around the beans. And so it's, it's really helpful to, to farmers. And I mentioned the corn. So a lot of those soybeans and corns and, and corn varieties that are genetically modified, so they end up in our, our food supply indirectly, um, through, you know, feeding to, to animals. Um, but most, about 60 to 70 percent of all processed foods contain at least one genetically modified um, plant. You know, you can say that, no, I don't eat genetically modified plants. You know, I, I'm... I'm I don't eat genetically modified organisms, but really you probably do because um, there's probably some ingredient from genetically modified corn or soybean. Um, and actually um, some, some products are the result of genetically modified processes. So for example, cheese is produced from a, um, an enzyme that's genetically modified. So even though the cheese isn't itself genetically modified, it's, it's processed using other ingredients that are genetically modified, such as that enzyme. Biotechnology, Patrick, I think you asked about this last time. It's really a, a collection of scientific techniques that produces plants and animals with more desirable traits. It does include crossbreeding, but it also includes genetically engineering. So again, crossbreeding is combining two um, different varieties of plants or animals to get a more desirable trait. And genetic engineering is when we go in, in the laboratory and we, we, will, um, we will go in and change the genetic code for those uh, plants or animals. Who is responsible for changing that? Well, like um, Roundup Ready beans are made by Monsanto. And so there's companies that will, you know, it's their product. 
and um, and then they, they sell their herbicide too, the Roundup Ready. Um, and so they get they they sell farmers the the seeds, right? And so but and then they they use their their herbicide. So it's mostly companies that the seed companies that um, supply these or or do the research and then they sell the products to to farmers. Now there are um, other products too that are um, are sold by, but most most of the research does come. From, most of the uh, research and development is is done through uh, through ag- agricultural companies. So genetic engineering is a scientific product which moves a snippet of DNA from one organism to another, and it produces genetically modified organisms. And so um, one example of genetic engineering is insulin. People like me with type 1 diabetes, we take insulin to help manage our blood sugars. And actually insulin is, most insulin today is produced by genetically modified bacteria. So there's a, what scientists have done is they've modified the bacteria so that the bacteria will produce insulin through their, their DNA. In the past, we've had to get insulin out of pigs. So we no longer have to do that because we've, allowed, you know, we've manipulated bacteria <clears throat> so that, that the bacteria will produce the, um, the insulin. If herbicides are used on soybeans, let's say, without ill effects, are these, these uh, soybeans safe to eat? Um, well, yes. They, uh, there, there is, the FDA has to approve all these products. And so, um, yeah, I would argue that they're safe to eat now. Uh, there is some concern. <clears throat> a lot of people have raised concern about GMO products. They are concerned that they could produce some sort of allergy, allergen that we might not have known about. Um, sometimes, for example, um, there is a, a while back, there was a, a controversy with a corn variety that was a GMO corn that um, wasn't really intended for our food supply. It would go into, you know, the... Uh, it was intended to be sold um, to uh, feedlots and that type of thing, the, the corn, but it got into our food supply. So there was a lot of concern about um, it might have had contained an allergen, for example. So uh, we, we have these things um, that, that crop up and, we, and there are those concerns. But, um, you know, growing, growing up, uh, I, I never knew that there was a peanut allergy or problems with gluten and uh, do, do you feel that you know some of the allergies that we currently have can be a result of GMOs you know that's that's a concern that I have heard from a number of different individuals yeah so we would be I mean most of our GMOs and our food suppliers so soy and, um, and corn I don't think our peanuts um, I don't think there's any GMO peanuts out there, so I don't think you could you could make that argument. Um, okay. You know, in terms of the peanuts, it, it does seem like there are more allergies out there. You know, from it's, you know people that have these these really severe um, allergy peanut allergies, and, and allergies are funny because I mean they not funny, but um, there's all kinds of allergies. I I used to teach Surf Safe, and I one of my um, Students tell me that um, <clears throat> they were allergic to yellow dye number six. <laughs> so, and that's found in a lot of um, you know foods and, and it's, as a as a food color food coloring. So you wouldn't be, you'd be surprised how many foods have yellow dye number six. <laughs> you know, uh, so there's there's a lot more processed foods out there, and there's a lot more opportunities for um, people to be allergic to certain types of things in our foods. And I, I do think there's um there's more awareness about allergies today as well. So there's some of that going on, but allergies are, are really a, a big problem <clears throat> today with a lot of people. You know, I don't know, I'm not an expert on, on allergies, but some people have to carry around a, um, you know, like a shot. And um, so they have to be very careful. And, and if they go to a restaurant, they, they need to be very proactive about asking what's, what are the ingredients and, and the restaurants need to be very transparent about what's in food, you know, in case, you know, in case there's some sort of allergy, like a shellfish allergy, a fish allergy, a peanut allergy, um, egg allergies, you know, there's, there's lots of different types of allergies, but they're not necessarily related to uh, GMOs. You know, the herbicides that we are currently using on our plants, um, is that 
a cause of concern uh, because I, I've heard of other individuals, you know, that would grow products without any herbicide because they were afraid. Yeah, most of the uh, organic um, producers use either organic types of chemicals or um, less chemicals, you know, when it comes to herbicides or, um, or pesticides, but it's, it's hard. I mean, most of our big industrial farmers um, are not organic. So um, it, it's just kind of a, it's a reality of our, our system right now. You know, we, we also use a lot of fertilizer too, which has, um, you know, implications for our, our water supply as well and a lot of chemicals. So, um, and that's, that's a whole nother ball of wax. <laughs> I, I guess we could not use uh, some of the current farming techniques and starve, or we can use some of the current farming techniques and have some allergies. Yeah, it's, uh, I think we have a very we have a very good food supply, though it has. I mean, just like any any science, it creates problems, um, but it also solves problems as well. And so, you know, we'll talk a little bit about the advantages of genetically modified crops. We we can produce crops that are more resistant to pests and weeds and disease, and so we don't have to apply as many as as, um, as many chemicals, you know, on these on these plants. Um, and so that's probably, that can be advantageous for our soil and our, our water supply. And that's a big issue. Water is going to be a big issue in the next, you know, century or two. You know, clean, fresh water. Um, you know, we're seeing Lake Erie right now with these, these huge algae blooms. You know, it's, it's a big issue in Ohio. So our, our water supply um, can benefit from GMOs. We can grow more food on less land. And this is going to be important because I think our world population is supposed to reach 9 billion people by 2050. So our farmers have to do more with less, basically. Um, you know, we're losing agricultural land to development and whatnot. Uh, we have climate change. We have um, you know, the earth is warming. And some parts that we've grown crops will no longer to be will no longer be able to grow crops. And so we, you know, we have to be very efficient with our agriculture. You know, another uh, potential advantage is growing more nutritious and flavorful food. And so this area <clears throat> is a little bit more controversial. Um, you're not going to find too many GMO, if any, I think there's an apple variety that's a GMO. But um, in terms of our, our produce, you're not going to find GMO. Most, of, As I said, most of the, most of the uh, fruits and vegetables that uh, you see in the grocery store are the result of crossbreeding, but they're not genetically modified. Um, now, the, the difference with corn and soybean, that's in a lot of, you know, your, our processed foods, but it's much different with, uh, with produce. But we do have the ability, for example, to grow rice varieties or produce rice varieties that actually have vitamin A. And so the, these, um, these rice varieties could be very helpful in some countries that have vitamin A deficiencies. Southeast Asia is an example. But there's been a lot of resistance because a lot of concern about allergies and that type of thing, a lot of concerns about GMO, which you know may be founded, but they might they might not be as well. So we have to think think through a lot of this. Um, I don't think this rice variety, it's called Golden A. Um, it was introduced into uh, it was promoted as um, as a rice variety that could help um, some of the, some of these countries with vitamin A deficiencies, but I don't know how readily they They've been adopted by, by these countries just because of concern about genetically modified foods. So we talked a little bit about concerns. GMO foods might contain proteins that people are allergic to. We don't really know the long-term effects on, on uh, human health and the environment. We might be producing, for example, if um, it, we could, some of the pest-resistant crops could be resistant to um, helpful larval as well. And then herbicide resistant crops could cross pollinate with weeds to create like a super, a super weed that might be resistant to some of our herbicides and that would harm our, you know, our, um, our agricultural system as well. And so there's some concern about reducing farmers costs in the long run as well. These, um, some of these products are very expensive and it, there's been some concern about some of the seed companies and having monopolies and, and that type of thing. 
so there's also the concern of agricultural biodiversity as well. And so we, we kind of have these um, monoculture of different uh, soybeans and corn varieties and, and wheat varieties. And, and what is that going to do as well? If you, if you have more of one type of crop and less diversity, if we ever were to have a major um, pest, that type of thing, that, that could be a, that could really impact our, our food system. And so we've seen just recently what disruptions in our food system can look like with uh, the meat processing with COVID, where we've had some meat prices have gone up. There's been, in some places, we've had shortages of meat varieties in the grocery stores. So we could see something very similar as well if we had a big, if we had some pest infestation that we weren't able to manage or, you know, some sort of weed problem. And we're, we're constantly fighting these battles in agriculture. You can talk to any farmer. <laughs> They're constantly battling Mother Nature and and um, looking for ways to, um, you know, to have a, a you know a good harvest and that type of thing. So, Let, let's go back to the issue of water. Um, you know, in the United States, we get a lot of our water from the ground. Um, you know, it's interesting. Uh, in Brad Burgerford's uh, program, he indicated that specialty crops such as uh, vegetables, uh, not necessarily corn or uh, soybeans, but uh, growing lettuce. Every acre requires 27,500 um, uh, gallons of water each week. And where we get most of that water, if, if, uh, um, if it does not rain, is from the ground. And that they are showing, especially in California, since it's a major agricultural program, that they have used a great deal of the aquifers, uh, the underground waters. Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, that, that is becoming a concern. And I'm glad that you mentioned that, you know, as our population continues to grow, uh, the need for water, potable water, not only for our food supplies, but our our animals and and for us, uh, that that is something that that has a lot of people concerned about. Absolutely, yeah. It's interesting with climate change too. Some regions of the country and the world are seeing massive flooding. You know, and other areas are seeing um, you know places that were pretty temperate are seeing more arid conditions. And especially out in the Southwest and California, as you mentioned, uh, yeah, the climate is changing. And we're going to see really, I think, a lot of political fights between states. You know, California trying to get some of our water from the Great Lakes. <laughs> um, out west. I, I don't want to get too much into that, but uh, we're, it's, yeah, water is going to be a big issue in the next uh, century, I'm, I'm afraid, for our our kids and our grandkids, especially. Hey, and, and consequently, when you're looking at different plants and different uh, a variety of foods that we, we eat, ranging from the common staple of corn and rice, uh, different things of that nature, um, the need for water, hopefully, um, maybe they can do something where there isn't so much need for the water because it's the runoff that uh, can be detrimental. Yeah, and over, you know, over fertilizing is a problem. And um, so we have a lot, a lot of expertise here at OSU and land grants that are, are working on these issues. Um, and it's, yeah, it's, uh, I, I think we could do more in terms of promoting like local, local foods and, um, you know, we grow most of our lettuce out in California. We get most of our lettuce from California. But a lot of it could be grown in, in these parts of the country as well. Now, some areas, you know, we don't, you know, we should be growing crops where it's not efficient to grow <laughs> crops. I, I understand. I, and so, I, you, you, you know, you locally, good yeah, I don't think anybody wants a truly local system. But I think there are some, some varieties of, uh, of vegetables, for example, that we could grow here. Um, so, you know, even in greenhouses, so we can have them year long that, um, you know, so that's, that's something that we need to think about as well. Hey, we're, we're talking with uh, Dr. Dan Remley. Dr. Dan Remley is an associate professor 
uh, field specialist with the food, nutrition, and wellness at the Ohio State University College of Food, Agriculture, and Environmental Sciences. He is always open to, if you have a question or if you have a comment or if you have a need for additional information, Dan, Dan is one of those individuals that you can uh, contact and we'll have his information in the description. Dan, I want to thank you very much. Uh, it's always a pleasure. I always learn a lot of, of different unique things, you know, in regards to our food supply. So thank you. Thank you.